enjoyed the message about heaven last week. Those of you who came, there weren't many. I, I saw on the video camera there was just a couple cars here last Wednesday. But I uh, hope that y'all who, who, who came enjoyed it. Um, last week we started with this 12th chapter of Romans. And as I mentioned in the introduction, it's the uh, starting place of a different section uh, up until chapter 12 everything is basically doctrinal and then you have a parenthetical uh, part chapters 9 through 11 that apply specifically to Israel beginning in chapter 12 uh, Paul kind of <clears throat> uses all that he's said previously as a backdrop and as a motivator um, <clears throat> he reminds us in verse number one I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God, by the mercies of God. And of course, that not only refers to God's mercy, it also refers to his grace in salvation. It is pointing back to everything that he taught in the first eight chapters as far as what we have and who we are in Christ. And all of that is by grace. Uh, we, we didn't merit anything. Uh, we we who we are who we are and we have what we have in Christ by the grace of God. Uh, we do not receive what we deserve. That's mercy, and so he uses that as a motivator. He says, based upon those mercies, I beg you, based upon those mercies, and then he he challenged us to place our lives as a sacrifice on the altar for the Lord. And then he goes on in the next few verses, verses 3 through 16. Uh, and he, add, he, he, he adds on that, he, he, uh, uh, re referring to what mercy should motivate us to do. And, and so in verse number 3, <clears throat> he says, For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to... Think of himself more highly than he ought to think. But to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness verses 3 through 8 apply to our relationship to the church uh, of Jesus Christ that is to the body uh, and he begins in verse 3 by saying you need to maintain a correct attitude toward the body of Christ toward the church when I say the church I mean the people when I say the body, I mean the people, the members that make it up. So our attitude, it says, should be uh, one that uh, thinks soberly and that is not high-minded. Uh, as I think after you look at this whole passage, you'll see one quality that every believer needs, and that's the quality of humility uh, in order to apply these things. But... In verse 3, I say, therefore, <clears throat> the grace through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. God has given us all a measure of faith. Um, some he is gifted differently. It doesn't mean that they're superior or any better. Um, we're all recipients of faith that God has given us. We would never have had the faith even to believe the gospel had he not given it to us in the first place. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing 
by the word of God. And so he's the one who gives us faith. And so I've heard people pray, oh God, give us great faith. And I want to say that's a wonderful prayer. But the Bible says faith faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if you want more faith, then you need more of the word of God. You need not only to read it, study it, but you need to apply God's word and the principles that are found there in order for your faith to grow. Also, you need to be willing to step out on faith. That is, exercise the faith that God, God has given us. Faith is like a muscle. If you don't use it, you won't be strong. And many times our faith never strengthens until we step out on faith and believe in God and he gets us through this and then we look back later and say, well, I'm, you know, I can do great things. I didn't know that, but I can. Uh, I was reading uh, Matt and Bethany's uh, letter, they sent a letter out you know, to their supporters to say what they were able to accomplish. And when I heard Bethany talking about uh, changing those diapers and, uh, and, 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 and loving, the, loving on those children, uh, I, I replied, I said, I know that, that your faith was strengthened in this because it was a challenge. It is. It's some, you're totally out of your element. And that stepping out of faith requires that, being out of your element. And so uh, he reminds us that to not think highly of ourselves, that any higher highly of ourselves than we are, but to think soberly, honestly, don't ever, ever forget that you are what you are, you have what you have, only by the grace of God. Only by the grace of God. And so he says our attitude toward our place in the body of Christ should be one that's sober, acknowledging the fact that we've all been given the, the same gift of grace. We're in the same family. And then the next thing he reminds us of is that we're, we're all members of his body, verses 4 and 5. For as we have many members in how many bodies? One. Just one. And all members have not the same office. So we being many are how many bodies? One, one body in Christ and every one members one of another. And so if we're all members in one body, that body depends on the members to function, doesn't it? Now, not all members have the same office. You don't have, all have the same job. You don't all have the same position, so to speak. But we all are members of the same body. And the body, in order to thrive, to grow, in, in order to function as God would have it, depends upon the members of the body working together. I mean, it's like if I had woke up one morning and my, my right thumb wouldn't work. For whatever reason, it just wouldn't move. It just stands there. That's a member of my body, isn't it? It's a member. If my right thumb wouldn't function, it would be difficult for me to pick up anything, wouldn't it? You have this opposing thumb that allows you to grasp things and pick them up. I need that thumb. I really do. In order for my right hand to function the way it should, I need that, that one member. And what we're suffering from in, in many, many ways in the church today uh, is a lack, not of members, but a lack of functioning members. That is, those who are putting their gifts that God has given them into practice and working together with the body. And the one tool that Satan uses in many, many local bodies today is that, is that uh, tool of division. Uh, where little groups, you know, and it's kind of natural to hang around the people that are like you, but we never need to, we, we should never forget that the whole body depends on us, not just our little group. The whole body does. We all have something to, to do in the body. We're members, it says, one of another. So you are part of me and I am part of you. God has not called any Lone Ranger Christians. Now you, might, you might be a kind of a Lone Ranger kind of person. You might be. Uh, when I was growing up, I was the only boy. I had two younger sisters, one older sister. Uh, I found great solace 
behind my bedroom door, closed, working on a model car, and I could sit there for hours, and I, I wouldn't be bothered. What's, I didn't need anybody else, just me. The problem with that is you, as you grow up, if, you, if you're like that, then you, you normally won't have many friends. <laughs> um, and, and we have to realize that God can help us come out of our shells and be part of the body because we have a place. We're members one of another, and the body depends on us. God has given each of us at least one spiritual gift, and that's given to us to use for the body, for one another. Uh, it isn't given to us just to sit up on the shelf and say, look what I can do. It's given to us to use in the body. So look at verse 6, and it, it just uh, names some of these gifts. This is not a comprehensive list of spiritual gifts, but it does name some. It says, having then gifts differing. I underline that in my Bible, differing. Not everybody has the same gift. Differing according to what? The grace that's given to us. So it's God's idea, okay, to by grace give us. We didn't earn these gifts. We didn't pray for these gifts. God gave them to us by grace. He says that's given to us whether, and then he names the first one, prophecy. He says if you've been given the gift of prophecy, then you should prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Prophecy is a word that can mean foretelling truth, or as in the context here, it refers to forth-telling truth. Preaching is, view, is in view. It's heralding the truth. Some are called to preach. And then ministry, or ministry, that's simply a word that means uh, to serve, but it refers specifically in the church to to the deaconship, but it also includes all acts of service for others. You, if you have a serving heart, uh, then what should you be doing? <laughs> you should be serving. Serving what? <clears throat> the body of Christ, right? And then it goes on to say, or he that exhorteth, Exhorteth means it's connected with preaching gifts and it means to give practical encouragement in obeying the truth. It could be used in as a Sunday school teacher, uh, anywhere you're communicating truth. The gift of exhortation is the ability to put truth in shoe leather and show people how with your words or with your illustrations to show them what this means in a practical way. Teaching in verse 7 simply means get to give instruction. Uh, and of course, we're called to teach people all things whatsoever I've commanded you, Christ said. That's part of our commission, to teach or to give instruction. And then you have the gift there of, of giving. And that refers primarily in context to one who distribu distributes for the saints. A deacon who was responsible for giving money from the church to help the needy uh, or distributing that money where it's needed. There is a spiritual gift of giving, though every believer is supposed to be a giver, just like God is a giver, but some have a spiritual gift to distribute, and they naturally, they naturally see those needs and then want to meet those needs. And what I find normally is that people who have the gift of giving also have something to give. God trusts them with resources so they can distribute them. You remember, in, you know, in those days, it wasn't uncommon. And if you look in 1 Corinthians 8, when, in reference to giving, it, the, the context in that chapter specifically was talking about an offering that was taken up at the, in the local churches to be sent to the saints in Jerusalem, to the believers in Jerusalem, those who many times lost their jobs. They didn't have anything to live on. So the, the funds were taken up in the local churches. Somebody in that church will be designated to take that gift and distribute it. And I think that's in view here, the gift of giving. Then there's the gift of ruling. It says, um, let him that do it, see, he that ruleth, 
ruleth with diligence. And it refers to administration, uh, administrative gifts, to be over something. Uh, and then the gift of mercy. Uh, we're to be merciful, especially toward those who are hurting, those who are sick. Uh, and we're to do it with cheerfulness there. It says, showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Uh, and, and that's important too. I think attitude is seen as well as, as heard. Uh, to show mercy to someone There's a difference between showing mercy to somebody because you have to and showing mercy to somebody because you really want to. And it gives you joy to do that, to provide that need. Whether it's uh, something you can do for them, some act of service, or something you can give to them out of mercy. That means maybe they don't deserve it. These are you know, down and out, hurting and sick people. And it's, it's doing it with cheerfulness. I think that makes all the difference in the world. And people can read that in us also. They know, you know, well, you know, I don't want to be your charity case. You know, they get, if, they, if it comes across like I'm doing this because, you know, I'm, I'm looking down on you, um, the, then they interpret it like, you know, I don't want to be your chari- charity case. But if it's done with... A, you know, a joyful heart and a cheerful spirit, and this is what I want to do for you, then it's received in a much different way. That's why I believe he put that word there, with cheerfulness. Those are the spiritual gifts that are listed there. It's not the comprehensive list. Uh, you'll find another list over in, I think, Ephesians 4. Uh, there's also a list of uh, spiritual gifts there that you can read about. But his emphasis in this passage is since we've received all that we've received by the mercies of God we number one have to make a decision to commit our life to be in service to, the, to our king to, that means die to self if, if, you're, if you're laying yourself on an altar that means you're, you're dying to self you're, you're yielding your life over to him everything you are everything you have belongs to him and then he says how does how does that apply to the body the body of christ and these are some ways that we can do that beginning in verse number nine he goes beyond the body and it goes to basically everyone else uh, that is as uh, dr ryrie says in his study bible in relation to society as a whole and in these verses Uh, verses 9 and following all the way to verse 21 in fact um, I found eight B's B-E eight B's for a better life and uh, the first one's found in verse 9 be real in your love all these start with a B be real in your love verse 9 let love be without dissimulation abhor that which is evil Cleave to that which is good. Dissimulation means hypocrisy. Let love be without hypocrisy. In other words, let it be real. Be real in your love. Let your love for God be without hypocrisy. That means you're not wishy-washy. You're not riding the fence post. You love God. If you love God, then what's your relationship to evil? What, that's right. What's, what's God's relationship to evil? Hate. So we're to love God and hate evil. Uh, if, if you're loving God, then you're not loving evil at the same time. That's hypocritical. And so let, let your love be without hypocrisy. Be real in your love. And then secondly, this is the second B, be kind. Be kind. Verse 10, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. You know, these, uh, you could do a whole message just on one of these verses. The, I mean, let love be without hypocrisy. That's one message. Then be kindly affection one to another. And this applies to believers. You see, the world, they truly observe our relationship with each other. 
uh, read a survey that I think Elmer Towns did one time about church growth. And what he said was a person makes a decision about your church within the first five minutes when they come in the door. First five minutes, whether they'll come back again. And the question was, what do they look at? And I was, I was thinking, well, they obviously are going to make a decision based upon how welcome they feel. But that isn't it. What they observe is how we love each other. How the church loves each other. That was more important to them than how welcome they felt. It's how we love each other. And so it, it's a very powerful witness when brothers and sisters in Christ live in harmony with each other and we show that kindness to each other. Don't allow the world to rob you of your compassion for people. And it's easy, I'm telling it's really easy uh, to become hardened in this world today. But we should make sure that we, we maintain our kindness for the cause of Christ. And then the third B is be engaged. You say, well, I can't. I'm already married. No, be engaged, verse 11. It says, not slothful in business. What's a sloth? S- slow. Uh, slothful in business would be lazy. Um, it says, instead, be fervent. In spirit, serving the Lord. Slothful in busyness. In other words, don't let your zeal for God slacken. Instead, be fervent in spirit. Or boiling is the word boiling. uh, In zeal for the Lord. So be engaged. Be engaged in service to the Lord. Be engaged in... In the body of Christ. Be excited about what you have in Christ. So that it shows all around you. And then the fourth B is be consistent. I've always said if I could make a pill that would. If you took this pill that would cause you to be consistent in everything. I'd be a billionaire overnight. Consistent. Be consistent. Verse 12. Rejoicing in hope. Patient. In tribulation, continuing, instant in prayer. I underline the word rejoicing, patient, and continuing. All three of those words refer to consistency. Uh, Hope, rejoicing in hope. Our hope doesn't fade as believers because our hope is in Christ and he doesn't fade. And so we're patient. In tribulation, that just means enduring. And then continuing, instant, in prayer. Patient in trouble, enduring tribulation, and continuing in prayer. Be consistent in your walk with the Lord. Be more like a thermostat than like a thermometer. A thermostat, you set that one temperature. Stay right there. And if they... Cold weather comes outside, the heating system kicks in and brings the temperature up to that one temperature. Be a thermostat, not a thermometer. Thermometer goes up and down, up and down, based upon what? The circumstances. God help us to be consistent in our Christian walk. And then number five, be generous. Verse 13 says distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality be generous with your time and your talents and your treasure distribute to the necessity of the what that's believers church members people in the family distribute to their necessity given to hospitality are you a hospitable person? Um, there's a great ministry in hospitality. Uh, not everybody is good at it as, as some others that we've met before. But if 
few people come to my mind when I think of hospitality. And uh, I praise the Lord for people like that that have been a blessing to me. Be generous. And then number six, be meek. Be meek. Look at verse 14. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather gives place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If thine enemy thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That's only possible if you're meek. Be meek. Meekness is power under control. Vengeance is whose? It's God's. And so when I yield my rights over to Him, I may be, you know, rightfully feel like I can get vengeance because of what was done to me. But as a believer in Christ, I have to yield my right to God because he says he will repay. And so I believe meekness is a powerful, powerful um, gift that believers can show. When we do not react the way the world expects us to, uh, and we yield vengeance over to the Lord. And that applies not only to the lost, but it applies to saved people too. It's a, a great testimony to God working in our hearts. Be meek. And then in all this, verse 15 reminds us, this is the seventh, be, be compassionate. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep. Would you say that it's easier for you to weep with those that weep than it is to rejoice with those that rejoice? Think about that. Honestly, I think it is. It's easier to weep with people that weep. I mean, when you, when you see the Facebook blogs and all the beautiful pictures of people when they're on their cruise or they're traveling around the country and you have to stay at home and work, do you rejoice with them? Well, I'm glad you're having a great time. Or do you say, don't put that on here. I don't want to see that. Nevertheless, compassion means to suffer with. It is normally easier to weep with somebody that's weeping. You know, when you read those stories about the bride and groom on, on their very wedding day, when they get in their golf cart and the drunk driver runs them over and kills the bride on the same on her wedding day, I mean it was so hard to wrap my brain around that. And as their parents, what would I be thinking if it was my daughter and about the girl that ran them over? It would truly, it would truly show who I believed in, <laughs> the way I reacted. Nevertheless. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. Weep with them that weep. And then finally, be humble. I mentioned earlier that you can probably combine everything that's said in this chapter with this one quality. Stay humble. Be humble. First Peter 5, 5 says, Likewise, ye younger Submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. It's hard to be humble, isn't it? Like that old country song, Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. Humility is a quality 
that according to Peter's passage here, and we believe that it's inspired by God, right? Every word, that we're, we're to be clothed with it. We're to wear it like clothes, humility. It, should, it defines us. It identifies us even as followers of Christ, humility. God, it says, resist the proud. Do you ever struggle with pride? I think all of us do. Those are eight B's that if you uh, apply those to your Christian life, it'll be a better life, a much better life. Did you get all of them, all eight? Eight B's for a better life. Father, we thank you for this passage and the Word of God. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the truth that uh, you uh, do share with us. And, Lord, it's a challenge when we read these things. Um, because as we're honest with ourselves, we look at ourselves in your word and we see how, how far we need to go, how far we are from where we need to be. Uh, once again, we're reminded of, of the wonderful grace and mercy that you've poured out upon us. You've given us the opportunity to be your children in this dark world. Lights that need to shine brightly for Christ. You've given us the tools to do that. The Spirit of God who lives in us. The gifts that you've trusted us with. Help us to explore ways that, Lord, we can use our spiritual gifts within the body of Christ. Give us a compassion, a love for each other that the world can't describe, that they can't understand. I pray that we might be such a loving family that it's obvious when people come through the doors and they'll want to come back and be a part of us. I pray you lead us and direct us this week, guide our path, use us for your glory, for it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.